Ambassador to Lebanon Angelina Ehorst says that Lebanon should be prepared to receive more refugees fleeing Syria and describes the humanitarian situation of the displaced Syrians as the worst since Second World War. Ehorst's comments were made during a visit to Syrian refugee gathering in south of Lebanon in which she met with refugees and asked them about their needs and hardships. Welcome, Mrs. Ehorst. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How is the EU working with Lebanese officials in order to alleviate the refugee situation? Lebanon has been, since late last year, asking the international community for support, vast support at all levels. So we have chosen immediately to come in, not just during the conference in Kuwait. If you remember, there was a call there for $1.5 billion to help Lebanon. But even before and after, today, the European Union is providing 1.24 billion euro to help those who suffer from the Syrian crisis. That's inside Syria, that's in Turkey, that's in Iraq, in Jordan, but mainly in Lebanon, because Lebanon is most fragile to the situation. Uh, in Lebanon itself, we are now in total at 250 million euro, which goes not only to the refugees, coming from Syria, but also to the, the communities here living in uh, Lebanon, and we have been welcoming all the refugees. And we made a clear point with the government that in our support, we wanted to go mainly also to the host communities who have been so generously and full of solidarity uh, helping the refugees. Welcome back. We apologize for the little technical failure. Syrian rebels have attacked a village in the country's east, killing dozens of mostly pro-government fighters, according to activists. The Syrian government official denounced the attack, saying it was a massacre of civilians. The killing, which took place on Tuesday in the eastern Deir Zur province, highlight the sectarian nature of Syria's conflict that has killed more than 80,000 people, according to the United Nations. The Britain-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said at least 60 people were killed in the village of Hatla in the oil-rich province that borders Iraq. In Damascus, a government official said the rebels carried out a massacre against villagers in which older people and children were killed. An activist based in Deir Zur said the rebel attack was in retaliation for an attack on Monday by pro-Assad forces from Hatla that killed four rebels. Speaking of Syria, although the EU lifted the arms embargo, the rebels in Syria are yet to benefit from the move one bit. And after the strategic town of Qusayr fell to the regime's hands last week, how will arming the rebels, could it possibly tip the balance in favor of them? Look at just the figures you just gave, one massacre after the other, one killing after the other. Obviously the first and foremost priority for us as European Union, and that goes with all those who want to play along, is to stop the war. We have fully, fully supported the political process, and we still believe that Lahd al-Brahimi, together with the United States, Russia, and all those, as I said, who want to be around the table, let's wait until the 25th of June, will get to an for agreement. For the Geneva yeah. Convention. For the Geneva Convention, which is really what is needed now, because all agree that there is no other solution than trying to find it around a political process. Now, in terms of arming, we have haven't lifted the embargo, we have given some member states who want to have the chance to arm the opposition, given that opportunity. So you, you, what we say, you transfer the, the competence from what is being done at EU level, now you can give it to member states to do. And the member states opted to say, we will consider doing that. That means by after 1st of August, because that is the agreement, uh, if there is then still willingness for member states to arm the opposition, uh, it's up to them to do it. And that goes towards uh, the groups uh, agreed upon and uh, following certain conditions. You know, you cannot just arm everybody. Um, these are discussions now held today. Right, they're held and you're waiting for the Geneva Convention. We're going to talk about that in a right. moment, though. You're waiting for the Geneva Convention to see if you're going to arm or not. However, the EU, it did not lift the arms embargo, but it's allowing member states, is what you're saying, That's to right. give to give to arm the rebels we did not extend extend it yet yeah. could if the ar if the rebels are armed do you think it could help the situation get better because it would allow them to fight back and maybe win after Qusayr fell into the regime's hands last week 
You know, these are all the issues now on the table because there are, of course, the demands from the opposition to be armed. Whether that is going to change the, the different, uh, the balance currently at hand, uh, that is a big question. That's a big question. And that's why all of us, I'm talking about 27 member states of the European Union, have agreed to give all the attention we have for the moment into the political process. And you will have to wait and see that that is going to happen, not just wait and see, but work on it very forcefully. I mean, I mean, all the work now being done to prepare, to get the opposition united, to get the different players around the table, that requires a lot of work, and that's what we are focusing on today. The Geneva Convention was supposed to take place in June, and it mm. is now being pushed till July. And do you think, it was supposed to take place in May, and now it's being pushed till June, I'm sorry. End of May, more or less, yeah, and then later. Do you think, there's a lot of discussion in terms of the opposition and what they want. They want to make sure that yeah. President Assad does not come, but he's been invited to join. Do you think both groups should be there, the government and the opposition? And if the opposition doesn't make it, can there actually be any consequences from the Geneva Convention? There are not yet, we're not yet there to say it's not going to happen. There's a lot of work going on to make the opposition reunite and to agree that they will meet with representatives of the current regime. That, that is, the formula still has to be worked out and decided. And that's where Lakhdar Bahimi is very, very, he's working around the clock on that particularly. And that's what we support. For the moment, until this very moment, I'm telling you, we still have hope that this can work. And we just have to say it's going to work. So then perhaps we can get there. Okay. Speaking of the Syrian opposition, well, it is likely to boycott proposed peace talks with President Bashar al-Assad's government unless its forces halt their advance toward the rebel stronghold of Aleppo. This is according to France's foreign minister, Laurent Fabius. He told France 2 that forces loyal to Assad are massing around Aleppo in preparation for an offensive to retake the city and build on battlefield gains that have swung the momentum of Syria's war to Assad and his Hezbollah allies. Fabius said if not halted, there won't be a peace conference in Geneva to start with. Which brings me to this question. The big difference today between Geneva 1 and Geneva 2 is that we know Hezbollah is involved in the Syrian war now. And this has changed the game because we know that Assad's regime is being helped by Hezbollah. So how does this affect, when you're going to the Geneva 2 convention, how is the mindset of the people and the officials that are going now? It's changed the game. The game, the rules are still the, the same. The as I, as I, no, but in a, in a way, you still want to make sure that all those who should be around the table should be there. Now, having more players coming in and openly coming, coming in and really forcefully engaging in fighting is very unhelpful. And we said that very clearly from the start. For all those who chose, particularly now for Lebanon, uh, you, you make a decision to not abide by Lebanese disassociation policy and just go across the border and start fighting. Uh, there are quite a number of groups, groups doing that, but we have been expressing very deep concern about what Hezbollah is doing there, what others are doing there, it should stop because you need to go back to the political process to make it work and not go back to the fighting. How long will you be fighting for? We all know the violence will not lead to any, any good outcome of this. We know that. Mm. So better stop today than tomorrow. Here's one last question in terms of the violence. The GCC countries and a lot of the mm. EU countries as well are now considering and are, a lot of them have already labeled Hezbollah as a terrorist group. And the EU is on the fence because they say if they label Hezbollah as a terrorist group, it could destabilize an already fragile Lebanon. So do you think Hezbollah's military wing should be labeled a terrorist or not? You know, let's go back to the whole discussion of Hezbollah in the first place. We had an attack on European soil. That's very serious. We have to make sure we prevent further attacks. You're talking about Europe. the Bulgaria attack I'm last talking about year. the Bulgarian attack and this is how the dossier, let's say, came to five Israelis all the were killed. Right. Exactly. And this is how it came to all the member states. You need to have the member states to agree on how we are going to react to this. What is the outcome of the investigation? The Bulgarian authorities asked the Lebanese authorities to help on the investigation and to find out exactly what's happening. That is what we are focusing on now. Discussion is ongoing. Uh, it needs to have, uh, for any outcome, whatever the outcome is, you need to have 27 member states agree on the outcome. And we are not there yet. The, the discussions are still ongoing. But we have to make sure in Europe that we do everything we can to avoid a further terrorist attacks on our territory. All right, but you didn't answer the question about whether or not you think it should be put on the terrorist list or not. 
you know, I, I'm, I'm not avoiding it, but I'm telling you it's the member states who are deciding on this. Right. And they are the ones who are going to tell us later on if they all agree together to put Hezbollah on a list or not. If they do put Hezbollah on a terrorist list, do you, how, what do you think the consequences are going to be for Lebanon? Um, let us look into that once a decision is taken or not. Uh, okay. And that's really how, how I look at it. We have to use common sense in these issues. We have to be uh, very carefully looking at all the different steps that need to be taken. And by that time, I'm happy to talk to you again. Okay, we'll, de we'll definitely make sure to bring you back. Thank okay. you so much for being with Thanks. us. That was Angelina Echhorst, the EU ambassador to Lebanon. Back to you, Linda.